Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining uh, this panel as part of the Justice in Ramadan International Conference. This will be a panel on 71 million, a uh, global crisis of conflict and forced displacement. My name is Daniel Sullivan um, with uh, Refugees International, and I'll be moderating the discussion. Um, we're joined by um, a great panel um, who I will introduce in a moment, but just quickly to say uh, Suzanne Salul from um, Syrian American Medical Society, um, Debbie Alman Tazer from Bridging Cultures Group, uh, and Palestinian writer Leila Al Haddad, as well as Puerto Rican Im Imam Yusuf Rios. Um, I'm going to start off by just giving um, a general overview of what we're looking at in terms of this forced uh, displacement crisis around the globe. And then uh, the presenters will talk about some of the specific um, places that are, are, are facing these challenges, um, specifically Syria, Yemen, Palestine, and uh, the U.S. southern border. Um, and I want to thank, uh, this is hosted by Burma Task Force. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll just get into it that uh, as the title of the panel suggests, there are over 70 million forcibly displaced persons around the world today. This has been a a rising crisis, more people than uh, displaced than at any other time in history. Um, and unfortunately, at the same time that this is happening, um, there have been lessening uh, solutions. Uh, the traditional solutions for displacement have been going down. Now, first of all, on those of those 70 million plus uh, forcibly displaced persons, about 25 million are refugees. So that's people who have been forced uh, by conflict, um, or by by climate or other uh, uh, persecution to leave their the country um, uh, that they live in to uh, to flee to another country. Usually, um, in eighty percent of the the, the the time of the cases, it's to a neighboring country. Uh, the the bulk of the rest of that seventy million are what are called internally displaced persons. So, uh, facing the same kinds of conditions as refugees, but uh, staying, fleeing their homes, but staying within their, their country. Um, and then you have a, a few others that are asylum seekers or stateless persons. So we'll, we will talk about, um, you know, what, uh, what that means for some of the specific cases. Um, but first, you know, we, we already, these are people who traditionally had, tr you know, some of the solutions were uh, to be resettled in other countries. That is, has been largely brought back. Uh, or to uh, seek asylum in another country. As we've seen around the globe, borders have been closing, and especially now with, uh, with COVID-19 and the crisis. Um, and so it was already at a, a, a downward trend in terms of what are the solutions for, um, uh, for displaced persons around the world. Um, but now we have with uh, COVID-19 and the spread, we have to recognize that uh, forcibly displaced persons are among the most vulnerable in the world. Uh, so in, on top of the challenges they already had. And uh, Refugees International earlier this year, as uh, COVID-19 was, uh, was starting to spread, did a report looking globally at, uh, at what are those, uh, those challenges that uh, COVID-19 in particular adds for people who are forcibly displaced. Um, and I'll just highlight a couple of those. And then, as I said, the presenters will talk about specific cases. But I think from the broader sense of force, forcibly displaced persons, um, a couple things to highlight is number one, uh, many of them, not uh, not all, but many are in camps. Um, others uh, who aren't in camps are in uh, urban slums or very highly congested places. So the first challenge is it's just not realistic for the advice that uh, that many of us get to uh, socially distance is just not possible in, in, for many of these displaced persons. The second common uh, challenge is that often they face um, underlying health conditions and poor health infrastructure. Uh, so there's already huge challenges, particularly in camps. Um, for example, I've, I've spent a lot of time uh, traveling to the Rohingya camps in Bangladesh and have gone to camps for in internally displaced persons in South Sudan. Um, and if you look at, for example, the, uh, the camps in Bangladesh, there's four times the population density of New York City. So uh, that's just a real huge challenge, lots of underlying uh, health issues. And then uh, the third thing is the challenge of getting um, accurate, reliable information. 
So, um, you know, again, going back to my own experience in, in the camps in Bangladesh, where uh, there's all kinds of rumors going on that, um, you know, if you if you report that you you got COVID-19, um, then, you know, you'll be put to death by the authorities because there's no cure. So that's, you know, clearly false. Um, or that uh, this is a, a disease that only bad Muslims get. Um, so it's it's one of these these things where a lot of false information is going on. Um, and there's often a lack of trust between people who have fled the country and the, the new countries that they're in, authorities. So it's a major challenge. Um, and in terms of some of the solutions that, to this and to, to displacement in general, I mean, there is a need to open up those, uh, the borders in a safe way um, and to, uh, to allow uh, asylum at a time when the, the number of people who are forci forcibly displaced is at historic highs is not the time to be lowering the number of people who uh, are granted asylum um, and the, uh, the assistance that is going to refugees and internally displaced persons. Um, another one is just on, uh, you know, conflict in the world. And, you know, the UN Secretary General has called for a global cease ceasefire to uh, address what is going on with, uh, with COVID-19. But we also have, uh, even, even before COVID-19, conflict was the, the major driver of, of displacement in the world. And, um, you know, I think some of our, our panelists will, will talk about how that affects um, some of the uh, specific cases. So um, I would just leave it that, you know, the recommendation I would make is that um, the, uh, the people who are displaced need to be uh, included in any response to displacement and specifically to COVID-19 to make sure that there's accurate information that they are uh, a part of this. And, and, the, and the main point that, you know, COVID-19 doesn't uh, respect borders and any really effective uh, response also cannot, um, cannot, um, cannot uh, be, cannot discriminate and has to include the, the people who are among the most vulnerable in the world and that is forcefully displaced. So, um, I'll end it there as the introductory comments and turn it over to our, um, our, our experts who will talk about some of the specific cases. And then I'll ask them a couple of uh, questions about, um, about what, what to do about this, uh, this global displacement crisis. Um, so with that, let me start off. Um, we have uh, with us, we have uh, Suzanne Salul, who is um, the founder of the Syrian American Medical Society Midwest Foundation. She's serving as president from 2004 to 2006. She is also one of the founders of SAM's National Foundation, uh, serving as national chairwoman from 2005 to 2007. Next, we have uh, Dr. Debbie Almantazer, who is uh, an internationally recognized award-winning educator, speaker, and authority on cross-cultural understanding. Uh, she is an influential community leader and the founder and CEO of Bridging Cultures Group, uh, Inc. And then we have uh, Leila Al Haddad, who is a Palestinian American journalist, policy analyst, food justice advocate, and public speaker. She is author of the memoir, Gaza Mom Palestine Politics, Parenting, and Everything in Between, and co author of the award winning documentary cookbook, The Gaza Kitchen A Palestinian Culinary Journey. And finally, Imam Yusuf Rios, uh, resident scholar of Islamic Learning Foundation Chicago, ICNA co-founder of three Puerto Rican Imams Project, former instructor, Guidance, Co uh, Guidance College BA in Sociology Philosophy, uh, BA in Islamic Studies, trained social worker and mental health worker, five years traditional study with the scholars of Al-Azhar in Cairo, Egypt, Imam of Majid Noor, Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, so with that, I wanna just start off with, uh, with a question and go around to our, our panelists. Um, First, could we just get an update on the uh, on the situation um, of refugees and displaced people in your particular area of, of, of interest? And so let's start with uh, Syria and uh, Suzanne Salul. Thank you. Hi, uh, good morning or good afternoon, I should say, to everyone. Um, uh, so um, just to give you an update, my uh, my I am uh, right now the executive director of the Syrian Community Network, um, which I was part of SAMS previously, as you had mentioned, but I'm now the executive director of, of, of SCN. Um, so and we founded that organization in 2015, which helps uh, resettle ro local refugees into the Chicagoland area and the U.S. Um, so I um, I was involved. Um, early, as I mentioned, with SAMS and with other organizations, um, and um, 
And, you know, just what, witnessing what's happening in Syria is just truly heartbreaking and feel like people don't know the breadth of the of the situation there and, and don't really understand the conflict. And, um, and what we're seeing are uh, is an unprecedented number of, of refugees uh, and that really um, you know, uh, spur, you know, got, you know, started the refugee crisis and, and that we saw unfold in front of us in 2015. Um, so Syria in, in 2011, uh, just to backtrack a little bit, uh, you know, inspired by the Arab Spring, a lot of young people went into the streets and demanding reforms and change. Uh, unfortunately, the, the you know, it, it turned into a conflict and, and, and into this never ending a uh, crisis that seems to get bigger and bigger all the time. Um, Syria was a country of 22 million people uh, in 2011. Um, now you have over 6 million people registered with the United Nations for High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR, they're, um, so they're outside of Syria. And inside of Syria, internally displaced, you have about 3 million people. So that's about half of the population of, Syria's, uh, of Syria who have been displaced or have been made refugees. Um, and then not to mention the number of deaths, um, the, the United Nations stopped counting that's in 2014 when, when it reached 500,000. So you can imagine now from 2014 until now, um, you know, probably we're looking at a million people who have uh, million souls who have lost their lives, you know, in, in this crisis. So um, this number is unprecedented. We saw people taking, you know, who, who were fleeing in 2015, very desperate because, you know, the situation was unbearable. You know, uh, they were, uh, you know, somehow <laughs> walking into Turkey and taking uh, boats, uh, small boats, dinghy boats uh, into Greece and then marching into Europe. And, and many of these people who were, who took to the sea, Many of them drowned, and um, not everybody made it to safety. Um, many of them, men, women, children, elders. Um, you know, it was unbelievable. And this is the time when the the world started to pay attention to what was happening in Syria. Unfortunately, people were not really paying attention to the cri to the, the the crisis and how big it was. Um, and um, I think that's that that was a call to action for people, especially when that picture of Ilan Kurdi came out um, in 2015 when he was washed up on on shore. Um, right now, what's happening in Syria is that. That, uh, the, the crisis still continues, even though it's not in the news. And so this is very important that um, things continue to happen. Um, uh, Russia and, and, the, and the Syrian regime continue to bomb hospitals and schools. And um, the world is not really paying attention. And, and it's so easy for all of us to just to say, well, this is, you know, a crisis far away. It's in the Middle East. You know, uh, as Americans, we're tired of, the, of hearing these things. And you know, also um, in many uh, in the administration, whether in the U.S. administration during the Obama years, or um, uh, what's coming out of the the rhetoric out of Russia and the the Syrian government, oh, it's ISIS. You know, pivoting to ISIS so that they can cover up on what you know the war crimes that they have been uh, committing uh, all along. So and it's really unfortunate. And right now, the last stronghold is. Um, is the northern part, northwestern part of Syria, which is the Idlib province. And we saw, again, a resurgence of, uh, of, of a bombing campaign by Russia and by the regime in, in, into this area, schools, hospitals, and you have the infrastructure of, of a whole country um, that's been destroyed, and especially now with the COVID-19. Uh, I mean, imagine right now if the spread of COVID happens in Syria where, where you've had lost hundreds of hospitals uh, all around. You have over a thousand healthcare workers who were purposely targeted since 2011 um, uh, who have died, uh, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, um, because, uh, because when you lose your, the doctor, your, your, your community's doctor, your neighborhood doctor or your hospital, you end up following, moving, becoming displaced because you need to go to an area that has services. And so when you don't have a hospital, you don't have a clinic or, or something and, and you, are, you are expecting or your wife is expecting a baby in, in two weeks, well, you have to move somewhere and you have to find, um, you know, a, a place where your wife can deliver that baby or that your child needs medicine. Uh, so that's how kind of, the you know destroying of hospitals kind of escalated the movement of people uh, to becoming displaced and so i mean it, the the situation is really horrible we saw refugees fleeing from you know to everywhere to you know whether it's greece to all parts of europe or to you know um you know drowning in the sea you have refugees in in lebanon there's over a million syrian refugees in lebanon you have over a million in, in jordan you have over three million in turkey um, and in Egypt and and elsewhere. So this is really a, a disaster, and I I really shudder to think what would happen when, once the spread, God forbid, the spread of COVID happens in Syria when you have this. There's no infrastructure for uh, for medical services anymore. Great, thank you. Now I want to um, 
move on to Dr. Amantazer and uh, the same question, um, you know, just in, in terms of Yemen, uh, what are we talking about in terms of an update on the situation um, for refugees and displaced, displaced persons? Um, and what, what is happening there now? Thank you, Daniel. <clears throat> and thank you for uh, the invitation to actually have the opportunity to report on the status of Yemen and what is actually happening. Um, <clears throat> much like Syria, this actually began with the Arab Spring. Uh, after the Arab Spring, um, there was a government that was put into place. And unfortunately, uh, when elections were up and running, um, something actually happened after the election. And so the situation got really bad. Um, the war actually broke out in 2015 in Yemen, where, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm suffering with really bad allergies. Um, where it, the situation got really bad um, in terms of displacement. And so we have thousands and thousands of Yemeni Americans um, who have family members uh, who actually, um, you know, are uh, facing a great deal of um, adversity. Um, when the war broke out, even Yemeni Americans themselves were not actually evacuated by the U.S. government. They had to find their own way of um, getting back to the United States. And many of them had actually, um, you know, uh, petitioned for their family members um, and were waiting for years on end. And then unfortunately, the situation um, was exacerbated by the Muslim ban um, under the Trump administration. And so many families actually started to evacuate their family members to neighboring countries such as Djibouti, um, uh, Sudan, uh, Egypt, Jordan. Um, there are people that are in Malaysia as well as India. And the reason that many of these families move their families out of Yemen is one, because of the war, and two, the U.S. Embassy was actually closed in order for them to actually be able to have um, their family member go in for their visa uh, you know, interview. And so um, we have thousands and thousands of families that are actually, um, you know, uh, refugees right now in Djibouti, Malaysia, in Jordan, and in Egypt, um, just, you know, languishing and, and waiting um, for their interviews uh, to be able to rejoin their families. The number of families that we have been um, at the Yemeni American Merchants Association, which I co-founded um, after the Muslim ban, we've only been able to reunite 15 families. Um, but this is, you know, thousands of families that are still um, not united <clears throat> due to the Muslim ban. And now it's become even, you know, even worse because those who were making progress with cases Unfortunately, uh, due to the COVID-19 um, immigration ban that was put into place by the Trump administration of no, uh, <clears throat> you know, no um, entry into the United States has made it even much more difficult for families. Uh, Yemen right now has um, cases uh, of COVID-19 um, just as of, <clears throat> excuse me, as of um Friday, uh, the number of cases are 35 COVID positive cases that have been reported. We know that this number is probably much more bigger. Um, knowing how this, you know, uh, disease spreads, it's through, um, you know, people communicating with one another. So we, we imagine that these numbers are going to get, you know, even higher. Um, and this is going to be catastrophic for a country that's already very challenged in so many ways, um, you know, from the war, from the infrastructure um, that has been destroyed due to the war, um, as well as to, you know, the lack of health care um, and humanitarian efforts. Right now, presently, as we speak, um, agencies, humanitarian agencies that have been providing um, uh, humanitarian aid have actually decreased due to COVID-19. And so you can only imagine the situation is only gonna get worse uh, than what it already is. Great, thank you very much. I, I wanna uh, turn now to Leila El Haddad um, to ask the, the, the question. Now we, we've spoken about Syria and Yemen, 
Um, so now let's get an, an update on what is the, the situation for um, displaced persons in Palestine today. Hi, thank you, Daniel, and sorry for joining belatedly. Um, so when we're talking, when we're referring to uh, displaced persons um, and refugees, Palestinian refugees and displaced persons, obviously we're referring to an extremely uh, broad group of people, right? Um, it's sort of a, a unique um, situation in the sense that the, um, you know, formally legally known as the Palestine refugees uh, comprise uh, a group that um, are under the auspices and care of their own organization. They don't fall under the auspices of the UNHCR, so they fall under the auspices of UNRWA, as many of you know, the United Nations um, uh, Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East. Quite quite a mouthful. Uh, and, um, you know, that just, just to summarize briefly, because a lot of people actually aren't familiar, um, UNRWA was established shortly after the 1948 Nakba or catastrophe uh, that displaced hundreds of thousands of Palestinian refugees. Uh, and um, it, it uh, oversees actually, Palis you know, and then they, and they refer to them as Palestine refugees because it was uh, refugees, um, you know, uh, who were, uh, became refugees or displaced um, in Palestine during 1948. And so at that time, there were actually others who were not necessarily Palestinian by nationality or origin that, you know, st still were um, uh, considered registered refugees. So that's why the term Palestine refugees. But uh, regardless, they, they had five and continue to have five areas where they worked, right? So it wasn't just in Palestine. As a matter of fact, there are more displaced Palestinians, um, both registered with UNRWA and not registered. There's two categories outside of Palestine than there are of inside. Um, and, uh, and the five areas, generally the field areas where they work, uh, are um, uh, the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, uh, Lebanon, Syria, uh, and Jordan. Uh, and, um, you know, a lot of people might sort of scratch their heads and wonder um, when we say like Gaza and the West Bank, but those were Palestinians, of course, that were displaced uh, from within uh, historic Palestine uh, to, you know, uh, Gaza, which then the borders are drawn around them, the largest, uh, which holds the largest number of Palestinian refugees and the West Bank, right? Um, and so I actually have a, re I don't know if, how do I pull up the infographics or do I just cue Hannah and then she does it? <laughs> Anyone? Hannah, do you know? No, she's not on here, I guess. I don't know. But I had some infographics I wanted to show. I'm not sure how that happens. Does anybody know? No? Uh, I, I think they should be following your cue, but it's just okay. a question of whether it's uh, been uploaded okay, or not. Okay. Okay. Looks, like, looks like you got it. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, could you go to the first one, Hannah, the one that just summarizes summarizes um, Palestine refugees in general, like the, the very first one I sent? Well, while she's doing that, I'll, you know, I'll continue. Um, so anyway, so that, that, that uh, crisis created, um, as we said, um, several million refugees. And um, UNRWA is a little bit different in the sense that it also um, services, all uh, right, so here, this is a good, um, and again, this is just the number that is actually registered with UNRWA, right? Um, not the ones, there are many, many others that are actually not formally registered. They either never got a chance to register or they didn't need to or didn't need to receive their services but are still considered um, um, unregistered refugees. So as you can see, um, you know, Jordan um, has, the large, and then, of course, within now modern-day Israel, you have a large number of um, displaced uh, Palestinians as well uh, that are not registered and are not able to receive those services. But Jordan has the largest number, but is also considered the area where Palestinian refugees are sort of ha the most stable in the sense that they have the most, um, you know, um, not full, but but the most civil and legal rights, um, even though their numbers are greater. Um, and then, of course, um, you have um, Gaza, which is probably where Gaza and Lebanon are the areas I wanted to focus on a little bit today. Um, uh, Gaza sort of the, the, are in the most, and Lebanon, the most vulnerable situations. And I'll explain why in a second. Um, and so uh, in Syria, you had something like they were always considered to have sort of um, um, the best possible scenario living um, conditions in Syria until, of course, um, uh, the war there. And uh, many thousands, tens of thousands of Palestinians from Syria ended up um, getting displaced yet again and going to Lebanon, where they continue to um, to live. And so there's a sort of a multi tiers of refugees, Palestinian refugees in Lebanon right now. Uh, my own husband is actually a registered Palestinian refugee, um, grew up in a Lebanese in a, in a refugee camp in Lebanon. And so I sort of get updates from their family on a regular basis, um, even before the COVID-19 um, as many of you know, there was ongoing tensions there and an economic crisis that um, disproportionately affects the Palestinians there. The Palestinians um, 
in Lebanon really have it the worst off because they don't actually have, um, there's about close to a little bit under 500,000 Palestinian refugees there. Um, and I want to say something like 12, if I'm not mistaken, um, refugee camps. Um, but the problem is that the Palestinian refugees there lack the ability to work in something like um, 29 different professions. They don't have full legal and civil rights. They're not considered uh, citizens, of course. They they have um, perhaps the worst category of a travel document or passport that I think anyone could possibly have. Um, and, um, you know, in addition, of course, to the overcrowding and housing conditions. But currently, with the economic crisis there and COVID-19, it's really hit them hard, in addition to, of course, the UNRWA funding crisis, which many of you have might, might have heard about when um, when uh, the Trump administration um, uh, cut all funding uh, to UNRWA, um, forcing it to seek uh, to funding elsewhere. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how sort of they've done that in a creative way with UNRWA USA um, in a little bit. Um, so, so that's the situation in Lebanon. Um, uh, in addition to um, not, of course, being able to, I think when I'm constantly thinking of comparing sort of the situation of the Palestinian refugees with, with others is that they don't have the ability, whereas most refugees, um, you know, uh, the idea is when and if they want, the idea is they can go back and be repatriated. Palestinian refugees don't have that option, right? So they don't have what's known as a right of return to be able to return to their historic homeland in Palestine. So um, thus their situation has been one of sort of constant temporariness, right? And um, and um, UNRWA has continued to service them over the course of these many decades um, and is considered kind of the sole um, sort of stabilizer for many of them, especially for, for those in Gaza. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the situation um, in Gaza now. I'll end with that. I know I don't have that much time. Um, actually, could, could you put up the other, inf the number two infographic just to quickly talk about like um, numbers of Palestinian refugees overall? Well, that's happening. I don't know. Anyone? Can you hear me? <laughs> there we go. Okay. So again, I we saw earlier where UNRWA works and where the registered Palestinian refugees are in the various like you know areas um, in the Middle East. This is one that this is an infographic um, that talks about the numbers overall worldwide, um, both registered and unregistered. So you can see it's actually quite interesting. I don't know if it's on here, but the largest number outside of the Middle East is actually in Chile. Um, in South America, um, I don't think that's on here, but um, and of course you have many in, and this should be this is in the thousands. So when you see like Gaza Strip, it's like one, you know, one point three million or whatever um, in Arab countries, West Bank, so on and so forth. Um, so this just gives you a sense for where where they are. Um, could could you go to the next one, please? The next infographic. I can't remember what it was, but I just want to see if that's what I want to be talking about next. Um, so the reason that Gaza is kind of unique um, when it comes to the situation of displaced Palestinians is because um, most of the population of Gaza, there's 2 million Palestinians in Gaza. Oh, is that the third one? I thought there was another one. Okay, that's fine. I'll talk about that in a second. The, there's 2 million Palestinians in Gaza, and as many of you know, they um, live in what's known as the uh, um, you know, largest open-air prison in the world. We've heard this before, this expression. Um, where they have uh, no means, they, they don't have any sovereignty, right, over their borders, over their airspace, over their, their sea um, space. They've been um, subject to uh, a blockade for more than 12 years now, um, you know, a, a near hermetic closure. Um, so it's a very sort of unique situation in that sense. And at the same time, the overwhelming majority of those 2 million people, something like 75 or 80 percent, um, are pal registered Palestinian refugees who are under the auspices of UNRWA. And so um, you almost have like several tiers of, of governance there in that sense. You have the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah, you have um, the Hamas administration in Gaza, and then you have UNRWA who oversees not only, you know, unlike the UNHCR, they don't have a mandate for protection, but they oversee the education, um, um, the work, the, you know, vocational skills, um, uh, the health, um, uh, and so on and so forth for all of these registered Palestinian refugees, right? Um, so that's why when something like cutting the funding happened in U.S. was the biggest funder, it really hits home hard, right? It, it really did create a crisis for these Palestinians, it, specifically in Gaza and Lebanon. Um, I can tell you that firsthand. Um, and so what you know you have in Gaza, the situation, of course, is compounded by the ongoing blockade, by the you know the ongoing closure, by the unpredictability um, of the um, entrance and exit of um, of goods, um, and of course, 
people, right, um, cannot move freely in and out of Gaza. So, so their situation is compounded by um, by all of that, uh, all that I've mentioned there. Um, and so, UNRWA does a really good job there, working specifically in mental health. In addition to education, the UNRWA schools are kind of top notch rated um, over there. Um, and so, I want to like con conclude because I know we don't have that much time by talking about like how they've overcome. I know that the second part of that question was. Um, um, you know, what's the situation with, with the Palestinian, the displaced Palestinian people? Where, do, where are they? Where are they located? Um, you know, what's the current scenario? And then the second part was kind of like, if I'm not mistaken, was, um, you know, action items, right? Am I, uh, am I right there, Daniel? Yeah, I'll be, I'll be turning to that one in a second. So you'll have to have a chance. On that, or should I just? Uh, if you just wrap up on that first question, then we'll do another round. Ah, okay. All right. That's, so, I mean, that's, pretty much all that I don't want to continue. I don't know what, um, if I was going in the right direction there, cause I didn't hear what everyone else had to say. There's a, there obviously what, I mean, I, in summary, there's a, there's a lot to cover cause we're talking about several million, um, you know, people here and it's sort of been an ongoing issue, not, not sort of one of an immediate crisis that has, um, happened and ended over the course of a few years or even a decade, right? It's, um, one that has not had a permanent solution. And so kind of it renders it unique in that sense. Um, and at the same time, um, is dependent on, you know, uh, um, on UNRWA. So just sort of something like cutting the aid in, in the hopes that, you know, they'll find a, a way or they'll be able to rely on themselves. We hear a lot of these tropes of like, why don't they just, why don't the Arab governments give them citizenship? Why don't they just figure it out on their own, right? It's not a tenable situation. So they are in that sense still very much vulnerable and very much um, dependent um, on the services of UNRWA. Great, thank you. Thank you, Leila. Um, and I just want to, in, in case anyone joined late, just uh, say that this is the um, Justice in Ramadan International Conference. We're uh, looking at a panel on uh, the global crisis of conflict and uh, displacement. Um, and we just heard from a panel of, of experts covering Syria, Yemen, and Palestine. Um, I understand our, our fourth panelist uh, has, has been unable to join so far. Um, who is going to speak about the southern border, but we'll bring them in um, if they're they're able to overcome the technical difficulties here. Um, but I want to move into a second question um, that, um, you know, as Leila sort of previewed, is turns to, we know we got a general overview of what the situation is. So from your view, what are the, what's, what are the big challenges that are coming up? And more, uh, I think more importantly, what are the solutions or what are some actions that that people can take um, and I'll just start off. I, at the beginning, I spoke about, uh, you know, how my experience is, uh, is, is largely on, on working on the Rohingya in, in, in Bangladesh and from Myanmar or Burma. And one thing that Refugees International we've done recently uh, was an action to starting an action to call for the U.S. State Department to uh, designate what happened to the Rohingya as genocide. They haven't done that yet. They've done a review and and uh, kind of laid out all the things that, that constitute genocide. But that's something that uh, is, is an actionable call that I think people can rally around that would push for more attention and uh, in action to help um, get at the root cause of the displacement of the Rohingya. So that's from my, my point of view. I wanna turn to the other experts um, and uh, we'll, we'll first uh, turn to, uh, to Suzanne, if uh, you could uh, fill us in on, on, um, on some of the, the key challenges and solutions, actions that you see in, in your work. So um, my, my work specifically with the Syrian Community Network, we do a, a resettlement of Syrian refugees and other immigrants uh, and refugee groups uh, within Chicago. And, and we have uh, chapters in other states, uh, mainly lo uh, we work locally. Um, so uh, the, the, the people or the refugees that come in, that came in through the State Department um, as uh, designated as refugees, um, through the resettlement process, we help them with uh, English language. We help them with getting jobs, uh, securing, you know, um, basic needs, um, and then we also provide like after-school programming and workshops and things like that. That so we, that we can help them in their adjustment. And so, um, you know, it's uh, it's so it's so funny when, when when people ask, "What can we do for Syria? What, how can we help?" Um, I mean, one of the, the the main things is just stop the conflict. You know, end the conflict. Uh, unfortunately, we've, we ha we don't have the leadership that we need to uh, pressure the regime and to pressure all of the parties that are involved to just end the conflict. And um, and this is where I think this is the number one thing that we need to do: use dipl all diplomatic means and pressure to um, to 
just stop the conflict and and focus on justice and 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 getting people to you know go back to Syria if they need to. Um, and that I think that should be the the number one thing that we need to focus on. But unfortunately, uh, the Obama administration did not show any interest. Now we have Trump administration, and one of the very first things that the Trump did uh, as he came into office is that he you know. Uh, you know, signed in the executive order for the travel ban, which, um, you know, limited the numbers of people coming into the United States who, um, and, and mainly Syria. I mean, he ran on this um, uh, in his, during his campaign in 2016 when he kept saying, you know, he, using, uh, uh, you know, we don't want to welcome Syrian refugees. Mike Pence even said that when he was the governor of Indiana. And then on top of it, we, you know, it was Syria and Mexicans, Syria and Mexicans. That Those were the two scapegoat, uh, you know, groups that he was using all the time. And um, and it's interesting because when we talk about the, the southern border or whether it's a Rohingya, it's, and it's all really connected. It, we, we should not look at these conflicts as separate. We should all look at them um, as connected uh, through um, uh, whether it's the anti-immigrant, anti-refugee sentiment, whether it's the uh, injustice of you know the, uh, you know in, in Palestine or in Gaza. I, I went to Gaza, by the way. I went. I was there in the summertime, and I saw it with my own eyes. Um, and I went. To, I traveled to Bangladesh uh, for the Rohingya refugees with um, with Med Global. And um, and I saw all of these things that were happening, and all these movements are interconnected. When you have um, you know an administration and uh, world leaders who are just so uh, anti you know um, you know uh, you know causing this chaos that is you know breeding uh, the the refugee crisis, and that's and that's the, the the main issue that we need to have leadership from the United States, from the United Nations, from uh, whoever it is, just to stop the, the the crisis that's happening and stop the bleeding. Um, I think that this is something that's crucial. And then we need to amplify the stories of the refugees, why they left. People don't understand why people leave. People think they're coming here to take advantage, to take our jobs. You know, we see this rhetoric, rhetoric about um, you know people, Latino uh, Latinos who are at the border, who are now stuck at uh, in uh, at the southern border. Um, you know, there's this rhetoric that they're going to come and take advantage of us and or that Syrian refugees are terrorists. This was really used a lot in 2015 and 2016. And so this is something that, you know, we need to address that, uh, no, people leaving because of war, they're leaving because they have to, they're leaving with a, with a shirt on their back and, and ending up and leaving in the middle of the night many times because of the bombing that's happening around them. Uh, what would you do in that situation if you were, uh, you know, if your whole neighborhood was being bombed? So I think this is the, the narrative that we need to focus on versus Versus this, you know, oh, they're coming here and, you know, kind of, you know, this whole like, you know, um, the, the, the stories that come out about immigrants and refugees as trying to come and take advantage. Um, and, and then sharing stories of, of the contributions of, of refugees, whether um, it's uh, people who are resilient, who are who created jobs in the United States, you know, who, uh, you know, Chopani, you know, focusing on these like positive stories, like look at the Chopani yogurt brand, you know, he's a, a refugee that came from Turkey and, and, you know, look at what he created and, and how many jobs he's created because of his because of his work so we should focus on the fo on the positive uh, issues but in terms of Syria I think people ha uh, don't really understand the conflict um, it was too often framed as uh, an issue with Isis it started out as pe young people just like our young people here in the United States that demanded wages that demand reform but it, it escalated and the government started to uh, persecute and torture and and um, and uh, you know uh, really um, uh, go after people but then the whole because there was this gap of leadership and there was this uh, vacuum that was created then you have these crazy groups like Isis that form um, and kind of like um, you know took the narrative of what's happening in Syria and this is really unfortunate because we're now we're turning a blind eye to uh, to all the things the abuses that were hap that are happening in Syria versus and then we're only looking at the lens through ISIS because this fits the narrative of the war on terror uh, terror after 9/11 and you know this this is more of a convenient uh, rhetoric versus what what really is happening in the Middle East and what's happening in in in, in Syria specifically there's a lot of injustice uh, in in Syria in Palestine Palestine and and uh, with the Rohingya groups, with with so many people in the Middle East, and it's it's really um, I, I something has to give, and I really worry about all of this rhetoric that's going on, and then the fact that we have um, uh, an, an administration that it does not understand what is really happening, and that we have the travel ban, and that we have the cuts in the refugee program in the United States. That that whole program has been gutted slowly um, uh, over the years, and now uh, you know I, I I really you know once um, the new year comes in, the new um, fiscal year comes in in, in uh, October of 20, 2020, 
when the president will make a determination of how many refugees will be resettled in the United States. Uh, last year, he he set the number, the bar at 18,000, which is the most that we can resettle. I Probably this year, it'll probably either be 10,000 or less. Um, and, and so this this program is being gutted, um, you know, one, one step, one year at a time. Um, and so I think this is something that we really should be alarmed about and we should uh, really care about um, uh, uh, that this, this is a program that is a lifeline to many people and it's life-saving. Um, so, I mean, there's just so, I, I mean, I can go on and on about so many things, but, you know, and, and just in regards for Syria, I think people just don't understand what's really happening and don't understand the gravity of the situation and how desperate people are. And if we can just have that empathy and understand where people are coming from, I, I think we would be a much better society where we have, we can um, uh, learn how to uh, accept people a little bit more and, and be more loving and, and try to understand where people are coming from. Great, thanks so much. And I think that's that's really important. I mean, uh, you know, as I said at the outset, we're facing uh, unprecedented numbers of people who are displaced globally. And now is not the time to be rolling back the, uh, the solutions that we did have, uh, in particular the the refugee admittance program. Um, so I want to turn to the next um, uh, expert, uh, Dr. Alman Tazar, to talk about the same question of, you know, what challenges and what what possible solutions or actions can be taken in the case of Yemen. I think um, what Layla said earlier um, in her presentation is that there's a lot of parallels in in many of these issues or, uh, you know, across, you know, these countries is really important. As I was listening to Suzanne, um, you know, it's similar issues that we are facing right now in Yemen. And uh, the refugee situation is just beyond um, belief in terms of people fleeing for their lives, um, fleeing due to the war fleeing due to, uh, you know, the impoverishment um, that, you know, people are experiencing in Yemen. Right now, we um, have 24.1 million people in need of humanitarian assistance. Um, we have 17 million people um, in urgent need of, uh, you know, sustenance to really help them uh, be able to, you know, support their families. And we have 17.8 million people in need of, um, of, you know, wash assistance, which would really help them be able to live, you know, what right now, um, Yemen is experiencing is the worst, um, you know, humanitarian crisis on the face of the earth, it's been, you know, designated as that um, by the UN, um, you know, th the drought situation there has been something that has been flagged for the last five years. Um, the fact that there is no, you know, clean water, there is no sewage system there. Um, just recently, this past um, month, there were actually um, floods. Uh, these floods affected 148,700 people in 13 governance um, since mid-April. Uh, these people were displaced from their homes. Uh, the, the flooding flooded their homes and created you know, unsanitary situations, which are the situations that create the disease that we see that actually develop the mosquitoes that end up affecting, uh, infecting people. And so these are just the underlying crises that ex that are existing and the number of people that are able to to flee, um, you know, to borders is, is very small. Um, you know, we are a country, you know, bordering Saudi Arabia, which we know the right now the tensions between Saudi Arabia and and Yemen. Um, in addition to that, you also have Oman and the number of people that are actually able to to flee there. So many are finding their way to to Djibouti, um, you know, by swimming and putting themselves in dangerous situations. But we have many of uh, uh, you know Yemenis that are there now because their families. Uh, move them there for their immigration um, visa proceedings to come to the United States. And the cost that these people are paying to just live in Djibouti um, or Sudan or Malaysia um, or any of these countries are astronomical. You know, what a, a Djibouti resident would be paying for monthly rent, um, you know, 
compared to, you know, someone coming from Yemen who's actually being supported um, by a family in the United States, it's 10 times the cost of what, you know, a, a Djibouti resident is paying. So the cost of living is, is really, uh, you know, putting a lot of families um, in distress. You know, due to the ban and the fact that many families are, you know, staying in these countries until their immigration proceedings, we in the Yemeni community have actually had three suicides um, by family members who were petitioning for their wives um, and their children to come to the United States. And, you know, due to the failing of the interview, we've had these you know, men who've committed suicide, one of them committed suicide because he couldn't no longer support them um, and, and found this as a way out. Um, so this situation, the refugee situation has so many um, ripple effects, you know, on communities. Um, we have children that are actually being separated from their mothers. They're permitted to come to the United States but their mothers have to, you know, continue waiting for immigration proceedings. We have a, a one child who actually is a son of a, a bodega owner, um, and he brought him to the United States because he was able to, but he had nobody to help care for this child. The father was the mother and the father, and he would take him to school, pick him up from school, and then have him sit in the back of the store until he closes the store and takes him home to go to sleep. What kind of life is that for a child? Um, you know, to not have a mother to tuck them in, and you know, at night, um, to give them a, a hot, warm, cooked meal, to have a normal childhood, you know, uh, that we would hope that every child has. And this is just a minor issue of, of you know, of a, of, of a child, but all of those families that are right now in refugee camps um, in bordering countries are facing far more hardship. And so some of the solutions that I, I would say that we need to work on is improving the immigration um, system that we have right now. Number one is repealing the ban. The ban must be repealed um, in order for families to be able to get reunited. Um, in addition to that, um, you know, people would not leave Yemen if Yemen was stable. The country has been destabilized and it has to be rebuilt um, and infrastructures have to be put into place for, for it to be a livable country um, instead of it being a humanitarian disaster. Um, and so I think that it's incumbent, you know, on all of the countries that have been involved um, in this war uh, in Yemen to pay, you know, reparations and help rebuild the country. Um, and I think, you know, opportunities like this to shine a light on, on you know, these countries and what, you know, their residents um, as well as their members who are in camps are facing is really critical for us to continue having these conversations. Great, thanks so much. Um, and so now I wanna uh, turn to Layla with the, the same question of big challenges. What are what are the, the key kind of solutions and, um, uh, and, and things that can be done, actions taken? Um, and then I just wanna remind everyone after that, I'll have, I'll have one more quick question. We're gonna turn to Q&A, you can submit uh, your questions through um, through the YouTube channel um, for Justice for All. Uh, and I think they're coming through on Facebook as well. So uh, some people have already done that. I encourage you to get your questions in. And uh, uh, with that, Layla. Yeah, I mean, I loved what Suzanne said about, you know, the, 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 um, the need to, uh, you know, humanize um, these narratives because that's ultimately, you know, that's a lot of what my informs my own work. Um, is that just that is I see the um, effectiveness um, of being able to sort of change a narrative um, through that way and really affecting people's um, opinions about a situation because you know we can talk figures all we want but it's not um, always going to be able to convey the reality of what's going on um, and and um, it's sort of um, you know obviously we need those figures we need to understand the context but it also sort of uh, reinforces this kind of like victimhood and, um, and, and pity. And I, I can tell you, speaking at least um, as a Palestinian from Gaza and knowing Palestinians in Gaza, um, absolutely resent that. Like it sort of infuriates them to be able to, to have the world view them as victims, right? Um, 
And um, so anyway, I mean, I mean, that said, I did, I did just want to, you know, um, speaking to sort of the the cut in funding and the and the need to just sort of not um, not end solutions that were working or helping at least. Um, I just wanted to read this little um, blurb from um, one of the you know owner way USA's talking about the ongoing effects um, and specifically in Gaza, um, especially with uh, everything happening with the funding cuts and, and uh, COVID and so forth. Um, due to the ongoing effects of the comprehensive land, sea, and air blockade, one million Palestinians, half of Gaza's population, and two-thirds uh, of the Palestinian refugees there live in poverty and cannot afford food for their families. This is a direct result of the ongoing blockade that's further threatened by the U.S.'s defunding of UNRWA. Eighty percent of Gaza now relies on humanitarian assistance from international organizations like UNRWA. That is a 12-fold increase on the 80,000 refugees who required assistance in 2000. Um, so, you know, and this is just to point out that Gaza was not a place that was deeply impoverished before, right? Um, it is a place that has a lot of potential, that has incredible talent, um, ingenuity, resilience, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and it also, I should say, when we parallel it with other situations, is not a place where people can sort of flee from, right? Mm -hmm. We've had three um, different attacks um, on Gaza. There was nowhere for people to run or flee. Um, so you're kind of fleeing internally within Gaza, mm -hmm. but you can't seek shelter. You can't, you know, people have tried, but they've drowned. You can't get in a boat beyond three nautical miles without being shot at by the Israeli Navy. You know, um, Egypt closes the border on one hand, Israel closes it on the other. So this is the situation in Gaza. But with that said, I wanted to jump to sort of like um, what, you know, I, I'm going to use the sort of a, the example of what UNRWA has done, I think, in a very um, effective and creative way to combat the, its defunding. Um, and so they created this kind of sister branch in the U.S. called Onorwa USA. Um, and what Onorwa USA has done is actually reach out in the past year. It's cr it created what, what was known as um, an Onorwa Alumni Association. So kind of like, um, you know, and this kind of goes into your third question. Um, it reached out to Palestinian refugees who have sort of gone through the system and were able to successfully, um, uh, you know, um, sort of, for lack of a better phrase, make it, right? Um, and, and give back um, to their communities and to other Palestinian refugees and using them as sort of a case study highlighting what is a Palestinian refugee, um, what do they, you know, what was their upbringing like, what, where are they now, what are they, you know, um, to be able to humanize the situation. Um, and so beyond that, they've also, um, you know, they do an annual, they've done like an annual Ramadan campaign where they um, get influencers um, to do fundraising for them. They do something specifically for the Gaza refugees called Gather for Gaza. Um, we hosted one last year, you know, it was a, you know, fantastic success. Um, and so they have people host iftars, for example, and then link to the fun, you know, fundra fundraising page. They do um, an annual um, Gaza 5K and they, they've done other ones as well to support um, uh, Palestinian refugees in, and they do that in various towns and cities. So all of these kinds of really thinking outside of the box initiatives, being able to tap into the willingness and the desire of um, you know, uh, really uh, well-meaning people, you know, in the United States and, and elsewhere to want to help um, effectively and putting them directly in touch and giving them means to be able to do that, um, you know, rather than just a, like a donate button or whatever, empowering them, right? Um, helping them to understand and humanize the situation of Palestinian refugees and then empowering them by giving them various toolkits and different ways that they can um, be able to directly influence and help. Uh, change the lives of Palestinian refugees. And I think that's, I just wanted to highlight it because I think it's really something that, you know, other organizations can learn from. I know the situation with the Palestinians is a bit different, um, but still, it's, I think it's worked incredibly well. And, you know, I encourage you to go to both the UNRWA main website um, and the UNRWA USA because there's a lot of fantastic little videos highlighting the lives of different Palestinians um, you know, um, and then, you know, photos as well. And then um, different ways that people uh, can specifically help, right? Whether it's you wanted to sponsor an iftar, whether it's you wanted to um, participate in a 5K or whether, you know, um, or in another way. So um, trying to end that on a positive note. Do you want me to address the third question or are we going to wait on that? Yeah, so I, I think that's a good um, yeah. uh, kind of bridge. I, I think we'll do one, one more. I want to do one more quick lightning round of questions. Um, I have a question and then... Um, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll read out some of the questions we're getting in from okay. uh, from those watching. Sure. So the question is, you know, when we when we think about all this and we hear about it, and those those of us who work with some 
of the displaced people and the people who are listening now, it can be a bit overwhelming, right? Um, so I do think it's really important about talking about the, the humanization and, and, uh, and really uh, highlighting some of those inspiring stories. I know uh, with the people I've, I've talked to when I'm in the camps, it, you just meet some incredible people. And, uh, you know, the example I have of uh, on my, you know, keeping in touch with people who are uh, in Bangladesh in the camps. And there are uh, groups, uh, women groups that are sewing masks to, to help try to prevent the spread of COVID-19 and all kinds of efforts like that. So I just want to do a quick uh, kind of lightning round with everybody. Uh, if you could just give us one example of something that you've seen in your work that has really inspired you or things that, um, you know, kind of, kind of leave it off on a little bit more of a positive note. So um, when we start with uh, Suzanne. Oh, oh wow! There's, there's just so many. There were so many stories and um, uh, of hope and resilience. Um, uh, two summers ago, I went. Last time I was in Lebanon, um, I went to uh, with my husband. Um, uh, with he had, his organization is called Med Global, and they do a lot of the uh, refugee work all over the world. And I, we went to a camp in, in Lebanon, and um, I visited this one family in the tent, and the girls Adima and Sara. Um, uh, they just. They were just so positive and so inspiring. I, I like, despite the fact that they lived in this horrible tent and the, it was like the, the road was all rocks and, you know, they, they just had the smile on their face that, you know, you, you know, it, it's like you, you think to yourself, like, if I was living like that, what would I, how would I be, how would I act? Um, and then the only thing they asked for, like, they have so much dignity. The only thing they asked for is to go to school. All we want to go to do is go to school. And it makes me think of my work in Chicago when, you know, we have our after school program and then seeing the kids when they come in and um, and like just go into the, the program to the room and they're, they're just so excited. And then when somebody reads, uh, brings a homework that they got, did well on it because because we helped them, they had a star on it or that they were able to finish a book or like Omar, who was 10 years old, who came in and finished his first book. He, he's someone who doesn't came to the U.S. at age eight. He didn't read or write Engl not one word in English, and now he finished his first book. You know, those things, kind of things, like I compare, like, people, it's so good to travel overseas and to bring those stories home and to put those, like, put things into perspective at the local level and at the uh, and at the international level. You know, you have children who can have the opportunity to go to school here, but then you have children who really are so bright and so positive and you know and they want to go they just want to go to school and when i was in gaza just to reiterate of what leila said it's true you, you there's nowhere to flee in in gaza um and so we saw so many parents we talked to they all they wanted is jobs for their children their teen children who are going into nursing going into you know doing studying and doing these types of things but they have nowhere to go or they have nowhere to implement that work and there's there's barely any jobs there or doctors who can't go to international conferences like my doctor my husband goes to uh, an international conference so he can up update his his skills but they've come up with creative ways to either tune in on uh, online or, or whatever, you know, things like that shows the resilience of people. And I think this is where, where we should focus on is the resilience of people when they um, have uh, nowhere to go, no school, no, you know, somehow, somewhere, something, uh, there will be a solution. But for people who are stuck in camps or stuck in like in, in an area like Gaza, they're really, it's, it's just really difficult to um, see the light at the end of the tunnel. And then you come back really uh, motivated to, um, to do your best in the U.S. to either amplify their stories, to um, to do better in, in serving uh, the um, the immigrant and refugee communities that we work with, to um, you know to focus on advocacy. I think advocacy is so important uh, to highlight the stories and to um, you know whether you work with different faith groups or with, with different civic groups uh, to bring out those stories um, of, uh, of people, the personal stories so that you can, you know, bring about change. I, we meet with, uh, our Senator, Senator Durbin, he's always very, um, supportive. So every time we go to on a medical mission, I come back and we, we, my husband and I, we go and visit him and we share the stories with him. And so he takes those stories and he, you know, shares them on the Senate floor or whatever. I mean, I think this is so important that something that our community, I think we need to do step it up a little bit more in terms of sharing what we, what we've seen, uh, overseas and then bringing it, making it local. Thanks. And I think that last point is really important, too, for those uh, those who are watching who are in the U.S. that, um, you know, getting a hold of your representatives uh, and, and, and letting them know um, that there's people out there who care about these these issues and, and that want to see change. Um, so I'll, I'll move now to Dr. Almantaza. I think you're, you're on mute right now. So if you could just unmute and then give us your uh, your example. Thank you for reminding me to unmute. Um, I think what's given me hope um, is actually the 
the development of this um, fully, you know, volunteer fledged organization that has emerged. Um, in, sorry about that. Um, in Yemen, that has actually um, developed uh, just simply a group of young professionals came together through Facebook. Um, there was a, a gentleman who, you know, Ma'in, uh, who actually was doing, um, you know, feeding homeless here in New York City at, in Herald Square. And he posted pictures and a young woman in Yemen saw these pictures and just direct messaged him and said, hey, you know, would you be interested in helping us do this in Yemen? And he's like, sure, how can I help? And she's like, well, if you could send us money, we can actually provide this kind of service. And that's what they did. And what they actually established was Mercy Bakery. Um, I'm sure many people have heard of it. It's uh, almost two years old, but it's been an incredible movement of um, this bakery baking bread and feeding thousands and thousands of people. It went from one bakery to now five bakeries and they're continuing the expansion. They've been able to raise over a million dollars. And what's really beautiful about it is the fact that it is um, all volunteer run and operated and um, really empowering young people to uh, join the movement and becoming a part of this. And so they've added a uh, Mercy Kitchen, which um, also provides food. They've been feeding thousands of people this month of Ramadan. Um, and they've actually helped rehabilitate, uh, rehabilitate a, uh, a building that was abandoned and made it into an orphanage um, where now they're gonna actually uh, help uh, establish a school within it. Um, because the building is really big. So it's just really incredible to see the resilience um, of people um, who are experiencing such hardships. And rather than, you know, feeling hopeless and despair, um, they're turning <clears throat> that, you know, they're turning this adversity into an opportunity to serve. And so that's really given me a lot of hope. And I've just recently joined the board um, of the Humanity for Relief and Development uh, organization, which is the, the mother organization of Mercy Bakery. Great, thanks so much. So uh, I wanna give Layla a chance to respond with, a, uh, with a, an example herself, and then we're gonna open it up to the questions that are coming in. Gosh, there's, you know, where does one begin, right? I'm, I, you know, I, like I said earlier, most of my work focuses on those sort of um, stories of hope and inspiration. Um, um, and I feel like we have so much to learn um, from people who have been through these kinds of hardships. Um, you know, and I just essentially focused mainly on, um, in, my, in my book, The Gaza Kitchen, mainly on women. Um, and I profiled a lot of women who have done really incredible things. Um, um, many of the refugees in Gaza, you know, who are involved in cooperatives or, um, you know, um, run farms or whatever. But, um, you know, just thinking back to my most recent trip in the fall, I was there in October. And, you know, I, like I, I, like, you know, all the panelists were saying, I had a hard time finding anybody who was, who was actually like complaining. You know, it was, it was mainly sort of this thirst for knowledge and uh, education and employment, right? Um, yeah, there was this one, um, I was speaking at, I was invited to speak at one of the universities and this young 16 year old boy like reached out to me on Facebook saying, you know, um, I really want to come and attend your talk, but I, um, I don't know if I can make it and, um, you know, can I interview or can I talk to you on the phone? And I didn't have that much time. Um, and I didn't understand his request until I, he showed up at the university later. And then I understood that he didn't, he was a refugee from the Maghazi refugee camp and he didn't have pocket change. He gets one the equivalent of 25 cents a day of pocket change. And he didn't have enough pocket change to pay for a taxi. And I felt horrible. Like, you know, it really brought tears to my eyes. And he was so anxious just to come and hear me talk and others, obviously, and interact with others. And, um, you know, and I stayed in touch with him after that. And um, and he was trying to get enough money to buy, purchase a very small starter laptop, which we were able to provide for him just so he can learn, can, you know, because he was going to these workshops and he didn't have a means to be able to not only pay for his transportation, but you know, um, practice like the coding and the programming that he's interested in, and all this. So, I mean, amazing. I met another young man who, um, you know, again, remember Gaza. You can't like, you know, 
go on Amazon and order something that you need or, or ask for something in the post, right? Um, and so this one, this young man I met um, um, created, built his own 3D printers, like 30 3D printers from junkyard scraps in his own recycled filament. I mean, unbelievable, right? And then he was using them to, to print tourniquets for the people that were getting injured um, and amputees and others um, and during the great um, Gaza march when that was going on. Um, and then, you know, so th people like this. And then, um, you know, others, I met a woman, um, Palestinian refugee in Southern Gaza that was um, created an initiative to feed, um, you know, children often, most of them were going to school um, or preschools without breakfast. The families couldn't afford, they could only afford one meal per day. So she created this program where she was like, you know, buying surplus produce from the farmers and then putting women to work to make basic pastries and things with that produce so that the, the kids could eat, have something to eat for breakfast. And then, and then, you know, I'll conclude with an example here closer to home, I'm a little bit biased, but <laughs> Um, my husband, you know, he doesn't like to talk about it, so I always have to talk about it for him. But he grew up in extreme hardship and poverty in a refugee camp in Lebanon. And um, and he always says, had it not been for the, you know, obviously for the mercy of, of you know, um, you know, Allah subhanahu of God. Um, and, you know, the, the services provided through UNRWA and the, the teachers who really took a vested interest in him, he wouldn't have made it here. But he ended up going from that refugee camp at 15 16 to a to a high school in New Mexico that offered him a scholarship to a college in Massachusetts to medical school in Harvard and now he's a, a you know an ophthalmologist at Johns Hopkins and and you know does a lot of work to specifically with Palestinian refugees in Lebanon who don't have the money to pay for you know um, um, for you know to, to provide scholarships and things like that with another organization there called um, ULIP that works specifically with Palestinian refugee students. Um, so, you know, and again, we, we, somebody was saying earlier about how we think of like refugees as sort of these daunting threats and as numbers, but when you see them as these real individuals and what the ability to be able to, what they're able to give back and contribute to the society, you know, going all the way up from, you know, someone like my husband here to the various individuals I mentioned in Gaza, um, it really helps you re rethink, um, you know, all of those um, caricatures and stereotypes that we have. Great, thank you. So now I'm going to turn to um, to the audience uh, questions, and please continue to get those in through Facebook or through YouTube if you're you're watching, depending on what you're watching. Um, I'll just start with the first question, and um, some of these are targeted towards specific people, and some are more general. So, if, but if you want to, any of the presenters want to jump in, just just let me know. So the first question was. Um, uh, I think towards Layla because it it's asks what with U.S. aid cut cut off. What are the options for Palestinians now to access social health and education services? And if I could ask each of you to just keep uh, answers to like a minute, so we can get as many um, questions in as we can. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, that's a really good question. I touched on it a little bit. Um, they were able to. I mean, they haven't come close. Owner was specifically right. The main provider of services wasn't able to obviously recoup the. Um, I think whatever it was billion some that they needed, but they were able to, they have been really good at this sort of creative fundraising I talked about. That's what they've been upping the ante and doing that, right? So tapping into like local communities in the United States and philanthropist individuals um, who just really want to give back. And so they've done this, all this creative fundraising from the, you know, social media influencers to the Gather for Gaza to the um, 5K runs. Um, and, um, they, and, you know, so they've been doing that. They have taken a really hard hit though. Um, I can tell you that personally, Palestinian refugees in, um, Lebanon and Gaza specifically, um, and the most vulnerable have not been able to receive the kinds of, um, uh, assistance that they, they were before. Right. So, um, specifically the medical relief, um, and the food, um, packages and things like that. Um, so they've just had to, you know, tap into other organizations and really focus on that creative fundraising. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question um, is for Suzanne. Uh, what's the future of Syria, the Syria problem in your view? Uh, well, the Syrian crisis is um, uh, is uh, the crisis, and and if we don't if we don't um, you know uh, work towards ending the crisis and the conflict, it will um, it'll just keep going, and then you'll have uh, more and more refugees, more displacement more injustice, more of everything that, that has already happened. Uh, something's got to give, you know, in, in 2015, um, the, there was a peak, uh, a surge in, in bombing and things like that. And people started to uh, flee and then get on boats and then they, many people drowned. And, you know, um, you know, I, I, I shudder to think about what would happen if another round of more 
extreme bombing, more extreme, you know, brutality, what will that will what will happen then? You know, if if in twenty when we saw that in 2015, 2016 with the with the drowning, what would happen? You know, um, again. Um, so unless there is a will, a political will to push parties, um, you know, to end the conflict, I just don't see uh, this conflict ever ending. Uh, I, I don't know. Like I really don't know. Like we're baffled. Uh, you know, um, the world doesn't seem to care. The you know that this that this the Syrian crisis changed the world. Because you, out of the, you know, there was always anti-immigrant, anti-refugee sentiment in the world. This was always, you know, there. And we always have right-wing groups. But the Syria crisis brought those groups out. Because when people started to see the Syrians going into Europe, marching in, um, you know, people started to panic. Oh, my God, you know, the Syrians are, or the Muslims, you know, because they're mainly Muslims. Um, and, you know, going into Europe, walking into Europe, there was an out pouring of support, but there's also an outpouring of, you know, uh, people who didn't want them to, to enter. And we saw this rhetoric in Europe, we started to see it here in the United States, and we started to see it all over the world. Um, and so these movements are interconnected. And so, um, uh, I mean, it just, I, I think if uh, we're, I think we're foolish, we've been foolish um, uh, as uh, in the US not to have more invested, um, uh, invested time into ending the conflict. Um, we've been foolish as a Muslim community. Uh, I see many Muslim leaders who talk about all kinds of crises, but they never bring up Syria. You have your fellow Muslims going into boats and drowning, and then they tell you, "Well, we don't want to get involved." Or you know, you know, how do you do that? How do you how do you go against your our values as Muslims that we're supposed to stand up to injustice? And then at the same time. Our whole story began with the prophet, uh, you know, our prophet being a refugee, going into walking in from Mecca to Medina, escaping persecution. And then you have Muslim leaders who just kind of, you know, we don't want to get involved. We don't want to, you know. Um, and so I, I feel sometimes I feel very uh, upset with our community uh, at the same time that they don't they didn't understand the gravity of the conflict. They, they thought it was just another thing that was happening. OK, you know, it's a little civil war and then it'll end in a few years. But it didn't. It, it's now ninth year. It changed the world that all the, the immigrant anti immigrant anti refugee sentiment started with the one with Syria. And then you have Trump. Um, you know, using that as, you know, uh, uh, to for his travel ban and all of the executive orders that he's been uh, putting into place. People are, you know, are not noticing that now that you have this COVID-19, that we're all preoccupied with this, that, you know, St his uh, his aide, Stephen Miller, uh, you know, made the, uh, that no immigrants will be coming into the United States, period. And this is not just during the COVID. This will probably per be permanent until, you know, Trump is, uh, is out of office. So, I feel sometimes that we we were we kind of did not pay attention. So I think this is something that we we should really advocate to end the the conflict um, by any means possible. Um, and you know, it, it, unless uh, otherwise something else will happen, and that will make things even even worse, more than they are already are. Great, thanks so much. And and uh, and I understand that our our. Uh, fourth panelist, um, Imam Yusuf Rios, has just been able to join us. So I want to give him a, a, a couple of minutes to um, to weigh in. We we looked earlier at the questions of um, what is the update on on the your area of expertise. So I understand the the southern border, U.S. southern border, and then what are some some actions or solutions that can be taken. So um, I want to just turn over to you, um, Imam Yusuf. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Basically, uh, most of the work has been uh, done, at least that I'm familiar with from my part, is uh, has actually been done by Imam Wesley Lebron, who was working with CARE, and a sister that's called, uh, her name is Um Hamza from Latino Muslim Foundation. And so they had provided me some insights into that situation. And what we're seeing there is that over at the border is that we're seeing not only people from Central America uh, and uh, North America from the Mexican side, so to speak. But we're seeing also Muslims are caught up in that uh, transition phase at the border. And there was a movement to try to uh, create a shelter for them. Actually, the Latina Muslim Foundation was trying to spearhead that because of the humanitarian crisis. Because uh, when by the time that people reached a certain point in Mexico prior to arriving at the Mexican and uh, United States border, they were finding that people were having a number of issues, uh, whether it was health issues or psychological issues or even at a spiritual level. 
so the the humanitarian crisis continues to be a, a real issue not only because of the symptoms and the symptoms you know i think everyone here probably is aware of that uh what the symptoms are that people are refugees but really uh behind the scenes in the in central america for a long time now we're talking maybe about uh almost uh 40 years 30 30 40 years almost there's been a um a destabilization of the economic situation of the central american uh countries and there's the overlapping problem of, of drugs and gangs and so that has destabilized the conditions for people to uh, have a secure life and that's basically the background of a lot of this and and you know it goes back to policy a lot of the problems that we're seeing with this migrant flow has to do with the wars in the middle east and it has to do with the uh the 80s drug trade you know the iran contra scandal that really destabilized central america and the low intensity conflicts that were taking place and so that just is is it just progressed until the point where you have failed states and that's what we're dealing with we're dealing with something as simple as poverty and people looking for opportunities to find safety and the ability to maintain themselves and feed themselves in environments which are extremely problematic and unsafe so that's what that's what we're we're seeing that that's the problem at the border that people are are trying to look for basic stability in a time period in which there's not a lot of open arms for people to come into another geographical location under those conditions you know and i think that with what was just mentioned about the borders being closed and with the situation of covid and the new policies is just going to escalate to another level so i think that we as people that are involved especially on the religious front you know i'm glad that we have these types of forums but i am personally disappointed that the human being is not at the center of a lot of, a lot of our religious discourse yeah. Thank you. you know and uh, and there's a dehumanization effort that's taking place within religious circles is taking place within the economic sector and is taking place within the political sphere but the voice of those who are claiming to claiming to champion rights and so on and so forth it has to be stronger from the angle of um the human being being centered now with what we're seeing globally we're going to just see you know a big demand for labor at any cost La the value of labor has gone down and so you, when you have these refugees when you have people that have been displaced we know that there's a dark side to that we know that there's human trafficking there's organ trafficking there's all kinds of stuff that go into this it's not just the issue of people uh coming into a, a state trying to seek basic rights but there's also the dark side of 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 what happens so that i think that we need to up our discourse on the dignity of the human being and i think if we don't raise our standard in in a non-sectarian way in in a non sectarian way i'm not just talking about uh religious organizations or religious orientations i'm even talking about political groups you know because political groups now have they splintered to such a point where they don't have a common ground but we need a common ground front that can uh look to make sure that the human being is the centerpiece right that there's a dignity point there that's that we're looking at uh, preserving and we're looking to fight for and we're looking at legislation and workers rights for children for women for displaced people uh and not, and not only on workers rights from the angle of a uh something of a wage that's not a slave wage but also from the issue of healthcare i think the issues remain the same but for some reason that's not was at the that's not what is at the core of all of this and so we you know as we witness the as we witness the situation unfold and transform and change i think we're going to be seeing more dehumanization and i think that the values that we're kind of calling on whether they're religious values from the uh, from the major religions or whether they're religious or they whether their values coming out of the liberal tradition I think a lot of that is eroding in the western world. And we're looking at a new phase, you know, of economics and politics which we don't really have anything to anything any common ground or any common background to call on. So we're in a dangerous position, but I think that you know the situation as I mentioned, 
without going into many circles, we have to make sure that we're injecting into the discourse on multiple levels, you know, whether it's whether it's the issue of politics or economics or even religious discourse, you know, or uh, even when it comes to the issue of civil liberties, when it comes to the uh, issue of humanitarian mm -hmm. work, we have to bring back the human being. And that's what's lost in this. So we, you know, we can take some lessons from what has taken place in the past when we talk about dehumanization. And we know that, for instance, we talk about the Great Depression in recent times because of COVID, but we also know that, you know, World War II, a lot of it was dehumanization. And so the dehumanization process, you know, as that took place, there, there was a need for a response. And part of the response that came out of that was to, you know, recognize the other. And, and I think we need to really push that. We need to push that, you know, the, the other has disappeared. The human being has disappeared. And as long as we don't have that, and we don't, I'll be honest with you, we don't have that front on it. No, no one is talking about the human being and, you know, the, 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 the loss of dignity of the human being and the dehumanization. Imam, Imam Yusuf, uh, um, yeah, I want to thank you very much for that, those comments. I think they go uh, go well with what we've uh, what, what has been said earlier. I think there's a common strain about the um, really important about fighting that dehumanization. And I'm just uh, um, conscious of, of uh, the last few minutes uh, remaining. So um, I just want to uh, I'll take just a couple uh, more quick questions. But first, let me just ask if there's any of the um, the presenters who want to want to give uh, any any final uh, quick quick thoughts, and then otherwise I'll, I'll ask maybe a question or two and we'll wrap up. Okay, why don't I, I'll just go back to the, uh, the I'll question. Just say one quick thing, which is, I know somebody was asking here, what's the biggest trope that, uh, about refugees that you have all heard that you would like to end? Um, I think it needs to be sort of made very clear that, you know, we say obviously refugee and it becomes this kind of like stigmatizing label, but really it's anybody, right? Any of us could become a refugee and we don't like to think of it that way. I think it's hard for us to even wrap our head around, you know, um, Imam Yusuf was talking about World War II, about the fact that, you know, like Europeans were refugees at one point. Nowadays we think refugee and we think like brown people or like third world countries, or whatever, or their nuisances or whatever. This could literally be any one of us, right? And they're human beings, they're individuals, some are wealthy, some are not, you know, some are professionals, some are not. Um, and so I think just being able to wrap our head around that um, help will help us, um, you know, like you were saying, center um, uh, the human interest part of this equation a little bit more, uh, rather than just think of it kind of as a sort of problem that we need to address or tackle in a very sort of technical way. Great, thanks. And one of the other questions that came in specifically was about what about um, strengthening civil society in Yemen? Many people seem to forget that still exists. There's, I think that can be open to everybody, civil society in whatever area that you work on, how can it be strengthened? So um, we'll just, uh, uh, I think, start off with uh, Dr. Alman Tazer on uh, Yemen, and then if anyone else wants to jump in on that civil society yeah, question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that that's a really valid question, and um, it's, it's one that um, is going to get a very complex answer because... I'm sorry, can you hear me? Um, as I was saying, it's one that is very complex, um, and it's complex because... There are so many fringe groups that are there. There, you know, the conflict is so intense. Um, and if you bring, like, you know, right here in the United States, if you bring seven Yemeni Americans to the table to discuss it, you're going to get seven different um, opinions. Um, and hard to really um, get people to um, come up with a, a solution. But I think the one thing that we all can agree, and I think that everybody is trying very hard to get to is to um, cease and desist um, and go back to the negotiation table um, and try to restabilize the country, you know, put in the, a, a government that's going to be reflective uh, of all of the different parties. So um, there are people that are working, but I think that um, in order to make this happen, there needs to be support from um, outside countries and the UN to really bring people to the table to help um, civil society resume living peacefully. 
Thanks. And I, I think, unfortunately, that's all the, the time we have for uh, for questions. So uh, if I can just wrap up very quickly, I think that, um, you know, there have been some really important common strains coming through these comments, namely, um, you know, this is not the time to forget the people who are most vulnerable among them, the uh, displaced persons. Um, and then that uh, it's not the time to be rolling back solutions like asylum and, uh, and, and accepting refugees. And then finally, the real importance of fighting uh, dehumanization when we're talking about these issues. So I just want to thank uh, Justice for All for hosting this. Um, and um, just wanted to mention, if you if you enjoyed this, this, um, this session, um, please consider uh, contributing to giving.justiceforall.org. Um, and again, I want to thank all of the, the panelists for uh, a, a wonderful, engaging discussion. And thank you all uh, who joined in. Thank you very much and, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Ramadan Mubarak, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.